Welcome to the Organizational Transformation Kung Fu Podcast with your hosts, Sandy Varekia and Jennifer Long. Hi, welcome back to Organizational Transformation Kung Fu, where we, myself, Jennifer Long, and my colleague, Sandy Varekia, talk about topics that she and I as executive coaches deal with relative to our client organizations. We've dubbed our conversations OT Kung Fu for the fact that if you're going to transform your organization, it's going to take time, practice, and discipline, as well as patience and energy to do it successfully. Transformation is a practice, not an event. So I'm here, located here in Denver, and Sandy is located in Toronto, Canada. How have you been, Sandy? Uh, Jen, I've been great. Uh, I was really thinking about the last time that we we talked. We were talking about coaching versus managing and, and kind of thinking about that as we kind of got set up for today and how much it costs organizations to to not invest in staff in their people and how many organizations that we're finding today that, that aren't investing enough. Exactly, right? They're really not uh, putting the time and effort in. Uh, that's where the budget always gets cut, right? Things get tight. Mm-hmm. Things get a little different. That's uh, Let's take away the the development option. That's right. That and marketing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, it's been an interesting thing, right? So um, to follow on to, on that thought is uh, today I thought maybe focusing on trust because I don't think that you can get development right if you don't have trust right. And trust is a big issue in a lot of organizations. Oh, you're absolutely right. I, I spent the last couple of days talking about governance with an organization and the the bottom line of, of good governance is trusting the people around the table. So at all levels of the organization, trust is so incredibly important. And I have so many cl- uh, clients that struggle with it. They struggle with it both, both vertically and horizontally. And mm-hmm. when, when there's low trust and the culture suffers, it's crippling. It really can be for organizations. Completely, completely. It's, it's, um, I mean, it can shut everything down, right? It stops workflow. It stops communication. It stops all kinds of, um, uh, potential growth and, um, it's activity. Yeah. Right. And it, it, uh, it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it's expensive it when is. you don't have it because you're doing, you're redoing stuff. You're having, um, time burning meetings after the meetings, meetings before the meetings, all that kind of yeah. stuff. The behavior, right. Is what, what starts to really kind of, um, take over it, uh, yeah. It's a driver. It's really, um, and it's a cultural baseline. So when you're thinking about branding your organization and, and getting your employee base, um, you know, attracting talent and all that kind of stuff, if you've got a culture that's got these issues, right, mm-hmm. the turnover goes up as well. Yeah, it's a really an interesting phenomenon because when you when you talk about building culture and you talk about branding in the same sentence, I don't think I've ever heard a branding exercise that talked about trust. Oh, right. Right. We're, you know, it, it, it's not a word that they use when they talk about branding, unless they're talking outwardly to the clients. But inwardly, when they're building culture, it's mm-hmm. about innovation and it's about agility and, and being adaptable. Right. Right. It's fascinating. And it's it's an interesting thing. So one of the things that um, in terms of looking at being able to get a handle on it with clients, so from a coaching perspective, um, I've been, I use, um, the profile XT. Have you ever looked at the profile XT relative to the trust measure that it, that it shows on there? Yeah, for sure. I have. Right. So for those of you listeners, um, profile XT or what's not profile XT, it's called PXT select now. Select. PXT select. It's a, um, it's a hiring tool fundamentally is what it's designed for. And it, what it does is it, is it measures thinking style, behavioral traits and interests and, one of the measures on the behavioral traits is um, outlook, which is basically a trust measure. And so when you are, and, and I don't know about you, Sandy, but I always use the PXT not for hiring. I always use it for development because it, mm-hmm. it allows people to see who's on their team. It's a really good profile to get a, a deeper understanding of why do you get the behaviors you get in your teaming environment, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, I'll never forget doing a group that was just really, really struggling. And so we did the PXT and on the, the team outlook that I did with them, everybody on the team. So it does a bell curve listeners on the, on the measure. 
and it'll tell you whether or not you're somebody who is inclined to trust or whether you're inclined not to trust, where you're more skeptical. So it's kind of this continuum. Then there's a bell curve that you're looking at. And on that continuum for the team that, that I was working with, everyone on the team except the leader trended to the left, which meant they all trended skeptical and they were like in the extreme. So like didn't trust anyone. And the leader was like super high. And so it was like the only person on this team that thinks you guys can transition and overcome your challenges is the leader. And the, rest the, leader. You, <laughs> and the rest of you guys are just like, yeah, I don't know. We'll see about that. Yeah. And I'm not going to trust you, the leader, because I don't trust. Exactly. Exactly. So it was very it was a, it was an interesting visual for them to fi finally go, oh, this is this is a huge issue for us. Because yeah. ultimately, I think um, people had to leave the team because they couldn't get enough dynamic momentum there to really believe that, you know, how do we change our experience? Did they have to leave the team or did, were they, did they leave on their own accord? Yeah. I think it took a mm -hmm. little bit of time. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because I don't use the PST select as much as you do, but I certainly use the five behaviors of a cohesive team a lot. And mm. trust is a big piece of that one and, and figuring out what bus trust and what builds trust in organizations and, and particular teams. And it's amazing when they you give a team the the license to talk about trust and what it actually means to them individually mm -hmm. and what it means to them collectively, that the, the aha moments of, wow, like we're either way off and on, as you say, on that side of the continuum or we're on the, on the wrong side of the continuum or, or some are and some aren't. And it, it's, you know, as I say, giving them license to talk about it amazing things can happen. Right. And I think what the five behaviors um, assessment really is excellent at, you know, having the, getting people to really understand how do you do trust, right? And I think that's mm -hmm. part of, from the coaching standpoint of really getting, what does that really mean? What does it mean in a teen environment? And then just what does it mean as an individual? How am I showing up? Why am I, like one of the questions is why do you tend to hold back? Yeah. Right. Why do you not trust? Yeah. And the conversation, right? Because that's really the, from a coaching and development standpoint, the conversation is, is the work. Mm -hmm. And so how, how long, when you're working with these teams, how long do those trust conversations go? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they do. Vary, that's a loaded question. Say, they do. So I typically break this, the, um, the five behaviors workshop into three days. And the first day is kind of trust and conflict. But the last one I did, the entire day was trust. Right? So yeah. the entire day. And so day. when it's always an interesting thing when you when the team says, yeah, we want to invest in doing the five behaviors and really kind of accelerating ourselves as a team and developing. I don't think they're ever really prepared for how long those trust conversations take. No, because I don't think, you go back to kind of your first thought, I don't think they understand that trust is so fundamental. That I, or like maybe they understand that it's fundamental. I don't think they understand that that is probably what is the issue. Yeah, that it's it's kind of a, a hidden and underlying because they're probably not aware how much distrust there really is and how much how often they're actually breaking the trust and they're creating. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when you, when you talk about um, so what are the behaviors that that sustain it versus the behaviors that break it and getting yeah. a real understanding of what those behaviors are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they, they really can. I don't think they can pinpoint how mistrust can manifest in mm -hmm. individuals mm -hmm. and then collectively. Right. 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 The simple the water cooler becomes really important, right? Because it's a hop in place. <laughs> it's a hop in place. The meeting before the meeting, the meeting after yes. the meeting. That's right. Right. So the, the, even the, um, the small things of, um, agreeing and then going in and, and telling your team something different, right? Yeah. So if you're, if you're leading a group and this is your leadership team that you're trying to make decisions in, and then you've got to take that information and cascade it back, how you do that mm -hmm. matters because if you're not full on and you're like, this is what I'm, I'm just bringing you the news. I'm not really on board with that whole act that happens mm -hmm. a lot. Um, what are some of the other behaviors that, that break it? Well, I think, well, th where there's that for sure, I think it's, it's not having that common message. And mm. so you, you come back to a team, but the team's not together and you, and you share a message that you think is the same message, but it's not. 
and it's, you know, so they get different messages that breaks trust. Right. I think there's just, there's just so many things that just erode it. Right. It's, it's, Hold it's the drive. I'm thinking like, like there's hundreds of things of, you know, people being late for meetings, people not being engaged in meetings, people um, doing things kind of covertly. Right? right. Right. Just being the act of being on your cell phone in a meeting. What the story that people tell themselves about why you're doing that. Right. Mm. And that a, you're not interested or you're texting with someone else about what's happening in the meeting. I mean, there's all kinds of judgment that goes into what you're doing and why you're doing it um, that have nothing to do with anything. But yet that kind of because you're just not fully engaged mm -hmm. and that behavior in and of itself, people start to distrust. Right. Right. And because I love it when you use the words um, around positive intent. Right. Mm. So people don't assume positive intent. No. Right. When there's mistrust. Right. right? There's everything is, is there's, there's, there's malice involved. Right. So I'm on my cell, they're on your cell phone. And I think I'm not thinking, well, you, you're waiting for your sitter to call. Right. I'm thinking, well, you just, you hate being in this meeting or you don't want to listen to what I have to say. Exactly. Exactly. And so, um, I think that, uh, I'm just going through the, the, I don't have a visual in front of me. I'm thinking about the reports that come out when you do the assessment for the team mm -hmm. and some of the questions they're really kind of focused on that they're talking about, about, um, distrust. So like the holding of grudges, right? Yeah. Do yeah. you, do you resent decisions that get made when you're not there? Um, mm -hmm. whatever that, you know, I'm trying to think of what else is on there. Do you, are you, yeah, I don't have it in front of me. I don't know the <laughs> questions. Uh, I just know that when we when we can debrief it the way mm -hmm. it's set up, mm -hmm. that whole notion of being able to be vulnerable and right. to assume positive intent is is huge, and, and it can be a, a page turner for teams. Right, right. The vulnerability thing. I'm I'm amazed. There's there's so much out right. So the Brene Brown stuff on mm -hmm. on shame and vulnerability and all that is really good at encapsulating what it is, getting to the heart of it. But even though you're starting to put names onto it, right? So vulnerability and really what that is is courage, and yeah. being open and uh, transparency. Um, how difficult people actually find doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they do. And, and, and like I say, until they can experience it mm -hmm. or, or understand that they were doing it. Right. Right. It's right. just sort of turning it around. So I think some of the exercises around that in terms of digging into under the covers as to what is creating that mistrust, mm -hmm. you know, busting trust, as I like to say, mm -hmm. and, and the things that they're doing that is adding to it because there's lots of things that add to it too. Right. But there's, Usually the trust bank is a little bit, I don't know, right. uneven on one side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the work that, so in addition to the five behaviors, there's, there's um, work that I do with conversational intelligence, which is very much about um, working the neurochemistry of the brain through language. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lot, the lot of, a lot of the focus of the coaching in that respect is also about how do I change your neurochemistry from the back of your head, your amygdala, which puts you in distrust and then puts you into the front of your head in the oxytocin and the prefrontal cortex, which is all about insight and strategy and the stuff you're trying to get to, to make good business decisions. Um, and where trust lives, right? So you can't in the, in, in the, the science is that you can't be in both places in your head at once. You can only either be in, in like your prefrontal cortex, or if you're in your amygdala, you're in distrust. And, and how do you, so piling that into the conversation to say, when you're actually having the conversation, the words that you choose have impact to people because they are, when you make a statement or ask a question, how you ask that question and what words you put into that can Somebody will paint that with distrust, like, why are you attacking me? Or why are you, you know, whatever that is. And they judge the, con the, the comment. So it's this interesting kind of cyclical thing that you have to kind of pull all these threads to get people to really parse out. It's not, it's, it's also how you are, what language are you choosing when we're in this conversation about building trust, right? Mm -hmm. And, and paying attention 
So then the emotional intelligence part, you know, leaning into, can you, when you're in these conversations, if you're going to build trust, um, staying out of judgment. Right. And I think that's half, half the battle is, is being self-aware enough to know when this person's trying to communicate with me about something that I'm finding difficult or that maybe I feel a little protective about because it's my area or whatever, and I'm falling short or whatever. Right. Can I stay open enough to the conversation to not judge in advance why they're asking or what, right. they, you know, and I think that is as much part of the, the skill set that when you're in there facilitating and trying to coach people mm-hmm. um, is really, you have to be that hyper aware of how is that based on what you're saying? How are you feeling about it? Right, right. So, so let's talk about judgment because I think that's part of, part of the issue is people go into judgment zone, right? Mm-hmm. A lot. And it's personal protection, protecting their space. Right. 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 Uh, so, so from a coaching perspective, how do you coach your client through understanding where their judgment lies? Right. Right. And are they even aware they're judging? Yeah. And probably that... not. Right. I think that a lot of that sits kind of dormant. Mm-hmm. Kind of like that, you know, that gremlin on your shoulder, you know, putting into judgment mode, but it's subconscious. Very much so. Very much so. And, and I think at times people don't realize how protective they're feeling. So when I'm, when I, when I train accountability, one of the things is when I, one of the skills is how to diffuse defensiveness and defensiveness is a protective distru- place of distrust. And so I always talk about that defensiveness comes from a place of guilt, right? Either guilt about what you did or what you didn't do. Uh-huh. And so I think people are like, oh, and I think that's kind of the trigger point. And so you're, you know, you know, when somebody opens their mouth that you did something or you didn't do something. And so you respond kind of preemptively because you've told yourself the story of Mm -hmm. what, what they're going to ask before they get the whole sentence out. And you, it's the conversation of, of, so the skill of, of staying, not being defensive is you got to stop the conversation and say, make yourself aware you know, or the other person, you know, the intention wasn't to make you defensive. I'm not attacking so that they understand they're having the emotional response to begin with. And so it's an interesting, that's why I say the emotional intelligence part is you've got to have enough wherewithal to understand that when you, when you're shutting down and going defensive, you're not going to get to a place to build trust. Right. You're right. working, you're or, or actively to, working against it. Yeah. Or be able to see the, the body language of the other person. So you're either in defensive mode or they're in defense, defensive mode. Right. And we know body language tells the you know, thousand words. Right. So if you can see the facial expressions, if you can see they're getting red in the face, they're they're shutting down. Right. They're in that active defensiveness. Right. And right. so you got to be able to name it, but you can't name it without having trust. Right. Or, or at least skill and trust in the mm. skill. Right. Because oh, okay. I think that's that, fair. right. Fair. So from a, if, if they're going to, so from a coaching standpoint and somebody's like, ah, oh, how do I, how do I even get there? It's like, start, start talking, just yeah. put a name on it and then keep the conversation going because that's, I always call it learn out loud, right? Mm. Go to a learning out loud. And, and part of the, the, I think the trust building skill is also, um, there's a skill called listening to connect, not judge or reject. Mm. And if that's a talk about Kung Fu, right? That's a practice of, am I judging it? Am I judging it? <laughs> Being aware that uh, I've got to try and connect to it instead. So if, if the, the tactic is always, how do I connect? Not how do I reject or defend yeah. or judge, right? is just accept, accept what they're telling. So it's, it's almost like, um, the improvisational rule around yes. And yes. So you and. just, yeah, <laughs> right. You just, you just keep going that way. So I think those are some key, uh, skills when I go into coach people on the trust end of yeah. it's, it's a discipline and how are you going to be self-aware enough to know, are you staying in connection or are you judging and rejecting? Yeah. 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 And some of the things sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll tell my clients is, you know, when you're going into judgment mode, you know, on some level, 
Mm -hmm. And so if you feel what it is that if you feel internally, mm -hmm. right, it may not show outwardly for you, but it, you, there's always an internal feeling, right? Right. They, you get a little hot, you get a little like, anxious, you get a little something. Mm -hmm. And to be able to call that and to be able to have something that you, you do that recognizes it so that they're, they become keen, keenly aware and more acutely aware when it's happening to them. Exactly. Exactly. And, and this, my friends, is, is the emotional intelligence, right? It's the... Am I aware of what I'm feeling? Yeah. Yeah. And then, then why? Yeah. Right? And you can, and you can figure out the why after, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if you know that you're in that feeling, you're in that zone, you know, have that conversation right. and then self-reflect after as to what it was about that conversation that made you react the way you did or have those feelings the way you did, because that's a lot about self-discovery. Right. Right. And the reminder here too, for people is you might not get it right the first time you might go back to your office or, you know, the meeting might be over, the conversation might end. And then you're thinking, Oh, well, I, I didn't do that well at all. Yeah. I totally got whatever. And, and, and you weren't there in the moment, but in that moment of realization, that is also the moment for additional practice. That is the moment to go back or get back on the phone or and say, you know what? I want to go back here because I didn't handle that well. And even yeah. if it's the next day, right? Proximity to time, as long as the relationship is, is there, right? You've got the mm -hmm. opportunity to start another conversation, which is another practice to go back and say, I didn't handle that well. And I want to do that one more time. I want to do right. over on that conversation we had yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. A little ask for forgiveness goes a long way. Yeah. Right? And, and that's part of the trust building thing. So that's yeah. the beauty of the practice of trust. Is mm -hmm. even if you get it wrong, you can go back. In fact, if you don't go back, it's you're breaking worse. the trust, right? You're breaking the trust. <laughs> you're, absolutely. You're not making the effort and yeah. you get a lot of points for effort, whether you do it well or do it messy. And yeah. that's, yeah. that's the best part. That's right. And, and, you know, when we do some improv around some of the coaching and sessions I do with teams, it is about that. It is about getting messy and mm -hmm. having, you know, what they would call failure in their attempts to, to have these conversations, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's getting comfortable with the uncomfortableness of building trust. Oh my God. So, right. So the, uh, so Lencioni, right. So five behaviors of a team, which is what we're sort of talking about. This is the model that, that Sandy and I are familiar with They're the, the base, it's a, it's a pyramid, five behaviors, trust, conflict, commitment, accountability results and the conflict one. So trust is at the bottom and the next one up is conflict, right? Which is the next big issue and the artificial harmony. Yes. Is like the M O in the boardroom. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I played, I played that video yesterday. Did you? And I said, you know, and I said, where are we? Are we in artificial harmony? Or are we in L? And they said, uh, <laughs> we're in artificial harmony, like uh, without a doubt, right? Because nobody wants to be seen as rocking the boat. Everybody wants to be nice. Oh my gosh. And it's... I said, you know, especially in the boardroom, your number one role is to ask questions. Right. And that just in that can create some disharmony, which is good because you want people to engage and differently and, and rather to always just to agree. Right. right. So it's, right. it's an interesting one. I love that. I love that continuum. Yeah. And it, I, I, it definitely has impact on the trust in an, in a fundamental way. Right. Cause the, the trust is all about the, the courage and the conflict is all about the stand in the moment. And so you have to have the courage to stand in the moment. They got, and they, and they work together and when you're in artificial harmony, you don't realize how much trust you break because you don't speak up when you should. When somebody's trying to put something on the table and you don't say you hold back, yeah. right? You don't really put in your how you really feel about it or what you really see or what your experience really is. You kind of cushion it or you don't say much or you don't address it at all. Mm. That's as much of a, a trust breaker as anything else, because then you don't feel like people are engaged they're, they're not authentic right right, right. but it, it, the the interesting conundrum of that is that majority of these teens that kind of live in this artificial harmony are doing it because 
they feel that they don't that there is trust there. There's so much trust that we don't have to engage in any productive conflict, as you will. Like we don't have to have a descending view because we trust that everybody else is right. And so this it's this this conundrum that of right. you can never you, you you can't get it's like a spinning wheel really you can't get off it because mm -hmm. you know you don't want to engage because you want trust to be high mm -hmm. yet. If you engaged more, the trust would be higher. It's it's fascinating. It is. It's it is fascinating. So one of the models I always bring when we get to the trust discussion is um, this. This is also based on the conversational intelligence work. So I've combined all that um, is this uh, using the acronym um, around the word trust. So the T being around transparency. So transparency is that are we are we all really saying what we need to say and are we all really bringing an open perspective and, and are we really um, standing in that uh, a asking asking the questions answering the questions authentically right yeah but yeah. what we know and what we feel and what we experience um, so I think that that's key the R is around relationship mm -hmm. and I'm working with a team right now that's that's um, struggling, right? So the work is just not there. The, the results are just not there. There, there are all kinds of reasons that that things aren't working, right? And they're metric heavy, and so they're always looking at the metrics. And you guys just need to do better. And this is yeah, broken, do more. right? Yeah. Do do all this other stuff, and let's look at them. We want to talk about the metric, and we want to talk about what you guys need to do and who needs to do what and what's missing from the whole value chain and who's leaning yeah. in and who's not. Right. But the interesting thing is I'm like, the conversations are always about the work right. and the issues are always on the relationship side. Yeah. I'm not because talking to that, people. A lot of that is that people aren't holding each other themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. right? right. So if you start looking at numbers mm -hmm. versus relationship, Mm -hmm. then it, it's all about the numbers and it, it's so-and-so is not doing the work they should do. Right? right. It's an easy scapegoat. Easy, easy. Right. Yeah. And then, and then, so the scapegoating is really essentially I'm throwing you under the bus yeah. and that is, I'm going to break trust with you because I'm mm -hmm. going to protect myself at the cost of this relationship. Yeah. And there goes the relationship and there goes the relationship. And so when you look at trust, it's always relationship first issue second. Mm -hmm. always yeah. and and people find that a little bit disarming in the sense of if every time I show up and darken your doorway it's always about what I want how often are you interested in talking to me exactly you know and so whereas if if and I always liken it to the whole the bridge metaphor that relationships really about building foundation and then mm -hmm. issues are all about moving things across the bridge and if right. you've got strong foundations it doesn't matter how heavy the issue is you can always get it across yep but if you haven't worked on the foundation, when that stuff comes across the bridge, baby, that stuff breaks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It breaks the relationship, middle. right? Yeah. So, so what's the you stand for? Uh, understanding, right? Understanding. So that that is when you're in the conversation. So that's part of um, seeking to connect and not mm -hmm. judge and reject. Do I really understand what you're asking, what you're saying, how you're responding, what the issue is? Am I spending enough time in discovery to, to really be on the same page, right? Yeah. Mutual understanding because I might be using language and you're assuming what, what that means. Right. And a lot of this stuff, you know, we act like this always happens in person emails, yeah. right? It's even worse. I would think. Oh my God. It, it It's yeah. even worse. So, I mean, you, you've got that in the mix as well in terms of how, how things fall apart. So that mutual understanding thing is huge. Right. Do yeah. I understand? Do I have enough context to understand what you understand? Yeah. And, yeah. It, and, it, I, and I think a lot of times they don't circle back. Right. So what I'm hearing you say is. Right. right? So then there comes the assumptions, because what I hear may not be exactly what you say. Right. And so I go off and do mm -hmm. only to find out that that really wasn't what you really meant That's to say at all. Over. Right. And how easy is it to take 30 seconds to say, what I understood you need is, or yeah. what I understood you that you want is. Yeah. I'm hearing you talking about this, but I also get your sense of urgency. 
Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so that's the you part. So the then comes uh, the S, which is all about shared success, mm-hmm. which is huge. In relationship, right, for relationships to be successful, it's part of that as well, is what's the win-win? Mm-hmm. What does success for me look like? What does success for you look like? Because if it's all about my success and not about your success, then it, then it's not a, it's it's a not a, a good relationship. It's not a, yeah. a shared result. It's not that 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 leads to distrust, and it's always about you, right? Yeah. And so that shared success understanding, and that goes from the the team perspective into a individual to individual, you know, which the, which is the whole basis around crucial conversations, right? Exactly. Here's how I'm experiencing exactly. you. Here's what's going on. What am I not doing for you that you need from me? And if we understand all that, right, as we're trying to work through something, mm-hmm. going to shared success is a is a trust strategy. Exactly. And then the last one is uh, the last T is truth telling. Mm-hmm. Right. Do I tell you the truth? Do I respect you enough to tell you the truth? Right. Or do, do I, I trust you enough to tell you the truth? Right. Do I respect you enough to tell mm-hmm. you the truth? Because that is an act of respect in and of itself. I respect you enough to tell you the truth. Right. Uh, you can handle the truth, right? All of that, it, it, because if I assume that you can't handle it, I'm judging you. Whereas if I'm not judging you, I'm like, yep, let me tell you what, what my truth is. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is <laughs> <not> probably going <laughs> to break. <laughs> so, so I hadn't heard that one. I had never heard of that term. Trust is an acronym. That's awesome. I like that. It's good. It's good. And what it does is I think it helps because I think people feel like trust is this um, small incremental stuff that happens over time, but it's that small incremental stuff. Well, what is that stuff? And yeah. I think that acronym helps you understand that's the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it certainly gives a, a foundation and building block to really think about trust a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk, we, when we started talking, we started talking about the fact that most organizations don't see trust as a, as a big thing until it's an issue, right? It's not a fundamental tenet of mm-hmm. an organization because it's assumed right. until it's not. Right. 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 So um, if they, I really think that more organizations could spend more time up front on teams talking about things like this rather than, you know, what are our KPIs and what are you going to, you know, complete them by? Right. So if I'm managing your performance, right, it goes to the simple act of, am I training my managers to look for this behavior in addition to the key results that they're getting? Right. Right. So I'm always, when I'm one of the, one of the coaching strategies is always is, do you have an expectation that people have positive, productive working relationships Mm -hmm. in addition to what all this other stuff is that, that you think they're struggling with? Yeah. Because if that relationship standard and expectation isn't there, then the effort doesn't go into the relationship in order to build the trust, in order to get the productivity. Yeah. And it has to be an articulated expectation. Right. Right. And I think, you know, so I think inherently people want people to have good working relationships. I don't think anybody goes to work not wanting their team to get along. Exactly. But I I know very few managers or very few leaders that actually articulate that, that it's a, that is a tenet of their their group, right? That we're gonna we're gonna have a good working relationship and we're gonna be successful as a result. Exactly, exactly. So I think you have to articulate it. You have to make it clear, and I think you have to start to really kind of look at what is the level of trust in your organization because it's a huge foundation, yeah. but it's also a huge cost if huge it's cost. if it's not functional, if it's yeah. not where it could be. Yeah, and that's why. We're, we talked about before we got on the air and how busy we are in our client <laughs> organizations. And that's a good reason why. Big reason. Right? A, a big, big, big reason big why. Big reason why. And it can take you an entire day to have a conversation with your team about I'm it. Interested. Because I'm interested. Interested. it's only about eight <laughs> people to the team. So. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, good. All right. Well, so hopefully uh, crew who listens, listeners listening in that this was helpful for you to get some ideas around what trust is, what it looks like, how it sits, uh, maybe some things you can do to improve it. Yeah, in your organization. I think, yeah, things to do improve it, things to spot it, mm-hmm. you know, things to start talking about it, right? Mm-hmm. And don't just really don't go to the numbers first, is, is, is my motto. It's not about why you're not succeeding in the numbers wise. Right. It's all about your team and your people because they're the ones striving for it. And 
just have the conversations openly. Right. right. You're going to get much better numbers if you get a trust first. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, Sandy, it was really good talking to you. You too. Thanks, Jen. I love talking about this. All right. I will uh, talk to you again soon and we'll Bye. talk to you on our next episode. Listeners, see you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening and please visit Sandy's website at satoriconsultinginc.ca. That's S-A-T-O-R-I consulting I-N-C dot C-A and Jen's website at managementpossible.com. Thanks again.